My name is Nathan Burrell, I'm the superintendent of James River Park System. Uh, it's a 600 acre natural area park in the middle of our capital city here in Richmond. I'm Laura Greenleaf, I'm a certified Virginia Master Naturalist. I'm a volunteer and I helped found the, um, invasive, the James River Park System Invasive Plant Task Force, which is what we're really here to talk about today, focusing on uh, the impact of invasive plants on the park system. So we were kind of talking about challenges that um, the park system has. Um, obviously, with the, as I mentioned before, 600 acre park, I'm one of seven staff members that operate that park. Um, and three of those staff members actually aren't technically responsible for day-to-day -day operations. One, or rather two, are um, part of my trails team and they manage over 40 plus miles of trail in the city of Richmond. Um, if any of you guys have a mountain bike or have been out running, you've been enjoying the fruits of their labor. Um, and one of those um, staff members is actually my um, adventure recreation program manager. Uh, so she's responsible for coordinating all aspects of environmental interpretation, uh, adventure recreation programming for our citizens. Um, so, leaves four of us um, to basically operate the entirety of the park, 600 acres, 1.3 million visitors a year. And so, linear, I think that's an important yes. piece, this is a stretched out, these units, how many miles between? Uh, it's fall seven line? miles, seven miles from the top of the fall <laughs> line to the bottom of the fall line, and we go just actually beyond the bottom of the fall line to Ancaro's, cross from Rockets Landing, you guys probably, some of you may go down there and go rowing. Um, so the, the green space on the opposite side of the river there, on the south side of the river, that's Ankara's. Um, that's uh, also Manchester Slave Dock. Um, so there's lots of things to take place in the park. So there's a wide range from adventure recreation to nature appreciation, all the way down you know, to just um, general historic interpretation. Um, so there's lots of things that go on in the park. Um, but with that, again, there's many challenges. Most, a lot of it has to do with staffing just to keep up with 1.3 million visitors a year. Um, there's a lot of information that goes into regulatory signage. Um, and I was kind of getting into um, you know, habitat, wildlife, and all that good stuff, kind of taking us back to where we're, where we're going, if you will. Um, so you know, we've, we've been able to document um, through work from BCU professors, biology professors, a, a number of different apex predators that are repopulating the park, which is a great thing for us. Um, as I was saying, you know, we have a number of coyotes um, that have been spotted. We've had, some of you may have seen the news that a coyote did kill a small dog late one, one evening uh, close to the park, and people were a little bit up in arms. Uh, we have an actual forum coming up on, um, on the 26th at Patrick Henry Charter School there on um, Sims Ave um, at 6 o'clock, if any of you guys are interested. Um, and there'll be a number of wildlife experts, myself will be there, as well as some um, biology professors from BCU, kind of talk about um, not only um, having those type of apex predators in the park, um, but what you need to do as a citizen to be um, safe uh, and responsible uh, around uh, having that type of wildlife around. Um, that's, uh, that kind of moves us directly into just general habitat. Um, if you guys are down, and, and I believe pretty much everybody was um, at the Keegan Flatwater, um, so it's you guys... Yeah. Sure it's, yeah, it looks I hope you guys didn't step into the stinging note. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you did, you probably had that experience as well. Um, but uh, invasive species are a huge issue within the James River Park System, and really in most parks. Um, any disturbed lands, uh, what ends up repopulating are invasives. Um, so while we have a great mix of um, native plants that are especially you know, in the upper stories and some on the mid story, um, we have a lot of problems with invasive plants, especially as it relates to um, ground level um, and you know, things that are starting to really take down a lot of our large trees. I wanted to ask a question. Are you all really, really familiar? This is, I'm assuming this is pretty familiar ground in terms of what invasives are, what we mean when we say an invasive plant and what their impacts are. Do you feel like what just throw it out like what would what's the definition of invasive that you all might come up with should we go over that <laughs> is that okay you want to talk about that it's like something non-native there are a lot of words that get thrown around like alien non-native invasive um oh sorry go ahead environment that it's introduced in. Right, introduced, that's a really important word. These are plants that did not naturally evolve here regionally in the area or where in a, in a particular place. 
they were introduced either intentionally um, or by accident. What might be like an intentional introduction of an invasive? So anybody know any stories about how some invasives? Yes. That sounds very plausible. One that comes to mind quickly for me is, uh, is Japanese stiltgrass microstigium, which is actually not one of the worst things we have in the park system, but it's pretty much rampant in most of Virginia. And that was introduced in the early 1900s as a packing material. It wasn't brought here to plant. It came here as packing material, uh, because when it's dried, it looks like straw, basically. And I can see where it made good packing material for China. It's now taken over our forest floors uh, in Virginia. You might know the story of the American, the decline of the American chestnut. That was a intentional planting of an ornamental tree that carried um, a fungus, which our native chestnuts, chestnuts were not, uh, could not resist the chestnut blight. These are some of the ways that we introduce invasive species. They outcompete our native species because nothing, they didn't evolve here, nothing wants to eat them. Nothing can really live off them. Nothing, nothing keeps them in check. They just run rampant and they squeeze out native plants, um, reducing biodiversity. And this is a little rundown. I mean, this is, that photo I think may also be from Huguenot. Well, that's ivy. And it's mostly winter creeper, euonymus, um, which is on the, on the ground there. But this is why I would want Nathan now to address like why the park system would care about the invasive plant problem in the park system. So as we've kind of discussed, um, the need for to to create greater biodiversity um, as a land manager um, that's paramount, um, and especially as a land manager of a, a wilderness setting. Um, now understand, you know, we are it, it's pseudo wilderness. It's pseudo because we've only allowed it to be that, right? Um, we're fortunate in the city of Richmond that, uh, for better or worse, when everybody was purchasing land, the river was filthy. So nobody wanted to be next to the river. We built our buildings, our houses, uh, facing away from the river and offset from the river. And that left lots of derelict land along the river's edge that became parkland. So luckily enough for us, all of our riverfront pretty much is public space, whereas as soon as you cross the border going into the counties, it's all private. No luck for having a trail or park access, because it's all purchased. But the need to be able to create a greater biodiversity is paramount for us. Um, we recognize that the land has been greatly disturbed um, in many fashions um, and has allowed that those invasive plants to come in. So as a land manager, um, it, it is it's our duty to help they try to at least mitigate uh, the, the actions that have been currently taken. Um, we recognize that we're never going to completely eradicate every single invasive in the park. That's, that's re unrealistic. Uh, we're not going back to colonial days. Okay? That, that's impossible for us to do. But we do recognize the need to be able to at least reduce those numbers. Um, and so the, the, the want to be able to kind of really get a handle on all the different groups that were actually out there doing uh, invasive species removal. Because at that point, we had U of R students, we had VCU students, we had random groups that were coming out and we'd do some removal here and then we would do a little bit of planting or we'd do some removal over here and we'd do some planting. But there was nothing cohesive that really um, lended itself to kind of have a firm understanding of what type of plants were out there how invasive those plants were, and what we needed to do to actually get them under control. And that was sort of the inspiration for creating the Invasives Task Force about a year and a half ago. It was late winter, uh, the winter of 2015. I live very near the Pony Pasture section of the park. I'm a master naturalist. I've worked on invasive removal projects, but I wasn't seeing a measurable noticeable impact. What I was seeing was things just getting worse and worse. And in the middle of the winter, what you see in pony pasture or pretty much most parts of the park, I mean, it shouldn't be green, right? Your column, your tree canopy column should not be green throughout the winter, but it is because the trees, so many of the trees are covered with English ivy and winter creeper. That was 
really influencing every walk I took um, throughout that winter. And I decided, yes? Here, Mike, uh, I think turn. I don't know. Can you hear me? Was it working for Nathan? Just happened a second. <laughs> you don't, it looks like it says low battery, actually, or lower, I, I don't know. The other thing I was saying is if you're in the back and you can't hear it, there's plenty of you know, you won't bite. Run, so there's really no excuse. If you can't hear it, you're in the back. Come on, yeah, don't be shy. Come on up. I'm just going to talk really loud for now until we figure this out or someone figures it out. As I said, I had been involved in invasive removal projects as a volunteer that we weren't strategic and coordinated about how we were going about it. Just basically invited a few tree stewards and master naturalists to gather around the table and talk about whether or not they felt the same way, and they did. And so we decided to immediately, who well, we were going to immediately talk to Nathan about this idea we had to create a coalition so that we could, this is an incredibly overwhelming problem, I mean, you know, organizations in, in, in uh, uncoordinated one-off projects are not going to make a measurable difference in this problem. But if we could come together and pool our resources, including people, money, expertise, time, and if we went about it strategically in the, in the places and the ways we could make a difference, there was a better future for the park system. Nathan agreed. And then the really exciting, and these are just some of the organizations that we immediately started community. We already knew each other. It wasn't, you know, this was not, we, we were already on, you know, on the same page. We were all obsessed with invasive plants. We sit down to talk to Nathan, and Nathan says, well, guess what? There's a private consulting engineering firm locally here in Richmond who have approached me. They're interested in creating an invasive management habitat restoration plan for the park system, which is exactly what we needed, because we did not have that level of expertise or that capacity to create something like that. There we go. And that was how the Invasive Task Force was born. So these are really two things that came together, the task force and the invasive uh, management plan. We then became the volunteer workforce to put that invasive management plan into operation. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it, it really was this like aha moment, um, especially for me because you know Laura came to me and said, you know, we have these this you know, large group of manpower and knowledge base that really wants to do something as it relates to the invasive species problem that we have in the park. Um, so again, at the same time, I was already in conversation with the professional engineering firm. Um, that had wetland specialists and all that type of expertise. Um, so the aha moment for me was, man, I don't have to spend $15,000 on this plan. I could spend eight and I can use our community, which works so well for us. If you know anything about James River Park System, you must understand that the community is what makes the park special. Nothing in James River Park System happened because government said, this is what we want to do community said, we got class four and five rapids, let's build a, a put in here, here, and there. And we're gonna pay for it, and we got the engineers, and we've got the architects, and we're gonna make it happen. People like you said, we wanna have trails. And now we have 40 plus miles of trails in the city of Richmond, or climbing sites. And now, invasive species management plan. It's because of the community that came together that we were able to be successful at this. I'll have to say, the, the, the management firm, BHB, was, were, their, their upper levels were a little bit leery of that. Um, if you can imagine being responsible for something that you're saying the community is going to give you all of this input to, it raises some red flags for those folks. They're used to just going out there and doing it, right? Here's their money, go take care of it, give me the plan. Um, so this was a very unique situation um, and created a great opportunity not only to educate our community um, but also really involve the citizens that care and love James River Park System. Um, do we want to go into? I was going to talk about the baseline study. Yeah. Part of the, the just the, the concept of from the beginning of the task force was in order to do the right thing, in order to choose wisely, uh, and apply our resources wisely, we need to really know what we're, what we're dealing with. It's like we know it's bad, we can just look around and know it's bad, but we need to know which invasives we have in the park, where they are, 
how bad they are and you know, the impact they're having. That's when, that was stage two, project initiation was all the sort of pl initial planning and developing this overarching um, timeline. But the, when we really got down to the hard work, it was the baseline study, which meant creating a, a survey of the entire park system. And here it is. How many units in the park system? Uh, it's made up of over 20 different management units. So how are we going to put boots on the ground in all of those units to inventory, to survey, to inventory every single invade species of plant and get an idea of how bad they are? And when we're looking at, when we're, when VHB was designing this, they actually had a methodology. There is a methodology for how you do this. It's, it's not a super precise science, but it's not just sort of winging it either. They used as their, uh, for their baseline list of the t plants that we would be looking for, this is the Department of Conservation and Recreation's uh, Virginia Invasive Plant Species List. This is every invasive plant in the Commonwealth of Virginia that's causing a problem. They rank them in terms of how aggressive they are, how, how they behave invasively, how bad they are. And then I think, I can't really read that. The, the regions, yeah, where they where they're present. Most of them are present everywhere. So this was where this is how VHB drew their list from. We created teams. So some of these units um, already had organizations um, engaged in projects on them. The tree stewards, Richmond tree stewards, were already engaged on Bell Isle. That was obviously their adopted unit, for instance. But all of those task force lead organizations took a unit, and they took responsibility for organizing volunteers, getting those volunteers trained by VHB in the survey methodology, how to, I mean, most of us were, had a lot of skill in identifying invasive plants, but how to judge what we were seeing in terms of the cover, the, um, the extent and intensity of the presence of a particular species. We broke up into those groups and all last summer, particularly in the glorious month of August, we were out there in the park doing these surveys in teams and then collecting all this data. This was my sur part of my survey team, the Riverine Virginia Master Naturalists were in Huguenot. This is Huguenot Flatwater. That's my son who was seven last summer and said he had a great time helping out but never wanted to do it again. Um, but he actually created a uh, a phonetically spelled list of the plants that we were identifying that was that was fun but his data wasn't included we did have yeah, we did have quality control here so that went on for months this is what um, the baseline study uh, forms look like the methodology that we were all trained in is this modified Ron bland cat blanket uh, <laughs> rating system it's a color coding needless to say red is really bad that's 75 to 100 percent cover of an invasive if you if you fade out to blue you're in the zero to five percent range i think that occurred maybe once yeah. um, <laughs> Rare. and we were looking at functional guilds this was a new term for me and i, I really enjoyed uh, getting trained in this but a functional guild refers to plants behaving similarly so vines were grouped together. Uh, herbaceous plants were grouped together. I think grasses were, th maybe yeah, grasses were separate, yeah. included. So the herbaceous plants included the grasses. Mm -hmm. Shrubs and trees, so they were organized in that way. We, as I said, conducted all of these surveys. So huge stacks of uh, documentation that VHB was the, <laughs> the job of, uh, um, of, of consolidating and, and um, boiling down into, into you know, reports on each of the units. They provided the quality control and there was our inventory. It told us what we were dealing with. What were the results? How many, oh, I've already told you. I've, I, I, I've given it away. I was gonna say, how many invasive plants do you think are in the park system? I would have said, I don't know what I would have said. Yeah, I don't know what my guess would have been. I don't know what my guess would have been, but unfortunately it's almost 50 that's identified. 47 invasive species throughout 83 management units across the 18 sections of the park. 33 of those management units had shrub species, highly invasive shrub species, above 50 per half the cover, half, half that unit covered um, 
with those invasive plant species. 55 management units had highly invasive vine species at 50% cover or above. It's real, yes, it is really bad. That's the bad news. And this is what the summary tables look like. If I think you all could probably get, if you were interested, could get access to some of this information. But that last column, percent of study area above 50% invasive plant cover. Virtually every one of those study areas is really up in the 80 to 100% range. And it looks like only two or three are at the 50% range. So again, it, yes, it confirmed what we knew, things are really bad. This is then color coded into maps in uh, every single one of those units. This is Bell Isle. Some of you mentioned that you spent time on Bell Isle, and so that red range is a, you know, that's then highly 75% um, to 100% cover. And then there's that yellow that's not quite so bad, and it's again divided up into these management units. And you want to talk about what the tree stewards have been doing on Bell Isle? You're going to talk. Yeah. Um, so that brings us to implementation. Um, so we've gone through, we've surveyed all 600 acres of the park, we know exactly what plants are out there, we know how invasive they are, and, and they've broken down roughly into those different management units. Um, those management units, I, I should say, um, if you, can you go back one? Sure. Um, you'll notice you know, each area of the park, but it has different, um, different numbers and, and lines demarking kind of where the edge of those units are. So this is how we broke down each of those areas. So again, it, it became you know something that's digestible instead of just go hither and survey all 60 acres of Belle Isle. It made it where uh, it was actually doable because it broke everything down into smaller pieces so that you could actually go from one end to the other and classify those areas. So I think that's that, that's important. And sometimes we changed them. Absolutely. We actually responded on the ground to certain landmarks or natural natural boundaries and so we made adjustments as we were surveying. Absolutely. Um, and that's where you see kind of the you know four has you know A, B and right. then a, is that an M? Yes. How we ended up with M. It made sense. But um, so yeah I think that's kind of that's important to understand. So you guys as you were working at Flatwater you were working in one of those management units. Um, so rather than again just sending all of you out and just you know go pull invasives, this is what they look like anywhere in this area, it's Here's our defined space. We want to make an impact here. I mean, did you guys feel like you actually made an impact in the area that you were working? Yes, no. <laughs> we'll talk about that. We're going to look at Huguenot flat water in a little bit. So implementation. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, we, we quickly moved uh, into implementation um, as we wrapped up at the end of the summer. Um, early um, fall, we began heavily, especially as it relates to um, Belle Isle. Uh, we selected a few areas, four areas in particular, um, to be kind of priority areas. Again, with 600 acres, if we just started everywhere, we really wouldn't see the impact that we were looking for. So instead of just spreading out our resources so thin across the whole park, we decided to pick four management units or four areas that we were really going to focus in on. Um, those areas are Belle Isle, Shiplock, Chapel Island, um, Reedy Creek, and Pony Pasture. Um, so those are the areas that we've really had a heavy focus on um, actual implementation of the invasive species management plan. And what's um, going on in this picture here? So <coughs> in this picture here, um, Tree Stewards has been kind of our champion on Belle Isle. Um, and if any of you guys have an opportunity to get involved with Tree Stewards, they're a great organization to be involved with. Uh, they're the folks that go around and trim all the street trees so they're not smacking you in the face when you're walking down the sidewalk. And there's a lot of classes about um, tree management, tree care, tree identification, uh, you pick it, you know, they care about trees, they like the Lorax, right, so, but a great organization to be involved with. But on Belle Isle, um, in the slide previous, um, they've been really focusing in on the riverfront side, on the north side of the island, um, roughly around the Hollywood Rapid area. Um, so if you've gone out there to the island, especially over the summer, you've probably noticed how, you know, certain areas you couldn't see the river, well, now, you know, it, it went from looking like this on the top to this on the bottom from a lot of their effort. Um, they've had a heavy focus, you can get to the next mm -hmm. one. Um, they've had a heavy focus on the, the western end of the island as well. Um, the, the want there was uh, not only to remove a lot of the seed bearing trees, which has been a heavy focus for us, um, there was a lot of Atlantis trees in, in this section of, of, uh, of the park, or Tree of Heaven, some of you may know about that. Um, 
we had a, we, so we really focused in on getting those seed trees out, those mature trees out, so that way we did not have a continual seed population that was continuing to, to you know, just put more more of those invasive plants into our area. Um, so with once we removed those, we really had a heavier focus on the understory, removed lots of privet, um, again with a heavy focus on anything that was seed bearing, um, and a lot of the other brown ivy and things like that that were kind of covering the area. Um, so this picture here, um, we've created a sign that kind of is associated with it, just so everybody kind of knows what's going on and that there's not just trees being removed just because we feel like removing trees. Because um, there are a certain amount of people, believe it or not, who feel very strongly about trees. Even the balance. Um, <laughs> so um, not only with this sign, but you know, having um, Having a large rock outcropping um, in this area of, of, of Bell Island of the park, I uh, really wanted to kind of uh, begin to, to show that off again um, because you, had, you weren't able to see it prior to this effort. Um, so this was really the first area that they focused in on. We were able to receive a grant uh, from Dominion Foundation um, the, to help with this work, we received a $10,000 grant for this, um, and that again helped pay for uh, additional plants, helped pay for some contractors to come out and do some of the removal. Um, we also had some pro bono work that took place as a part of that as well. And an important piece of implementation is to and to do it wisely, and to do it in a way that's going to have a positive effect, is that you need to know what to do, where to do it, and when, seasonally, is very important. And one of the bitter truths about invasive removal is that sometimes you can't just go in and remove stuff and think all will be well, and sometimes cool stuff happens. Native plants recover, and re there are certain things that seem to, re in certain places, rebound really well. Unfortunately, when you remove, when you're doing removal, you are potentially creating one of the conditions that encourages in biological invasion, which is disturbing the soil. So I have had this experience where you were working very hard on one thing, not, it's not in the park system, but just uh, elsewhere, um, and something else comes in behind us. Some other invasive goes, oh, now's my chance because such and such is, is gone and now I'm going to move in. So, these are factors that have to be taken into consideration. It's why what we're focusing on right now, and Nathan and I have a meeting tomorrow, a big phase that we're now moving into is creating what is called prescriptives for management and restoration. And a prescriptive is sort of like a treatment plan or a recipe of what to do in a particular place based on that particular habitat, what you do in a riparian area, an area right along a stream or a river, is different than what you're going to do in an upland area, for instance. Um, in terms of what plants you're working with, with the removal, with the plants that you're going to put in. You, want, you don't want to waste your time and money planting native plants that aren't going to thrive and survive and take off in that particular place. So we're also, another big piece of this is using best practices and working with our experience and expertise to do the thing, the very best thing that we can do uh, in a particular place and use the, the tools that are right for a particular species because when, like Nathan's talking about tree removal, you can't just go in and cut down Alanthus trees and think you've taken care of them. Does, does anybody know what Alanthus does if you cut it down? It just sprouts. It just keeps. It just goes. Oh no! I'm, I'm going to come back even stronger, and I'm going to, you know, it puts out these suckers, and you can have th thickets of Alanthus that just will not quit. So Alanthus is a tree species where you have to carefully use uh, chemical herbicides. You know, there's really unless they're small enough that you can get the entire root system out. They're particularly with with woody uh, stem species, trees and shrubs manual removal is not necessarily enough. So there are, something else we can talk about is just there's this whole, um, you know, this whole menu of treatment options when it comes to invasives. So you guys worked on Huguenot Flatwater. What were you, what were you doing? And those of you who have worked there, what did you do on Huguenot Flatwater? Yes. kind of like went around the lake to find out if the isolated island has different environmental uh, factors of the, like, the land that's like connected to that. Did you pull anything? I mean, were you were doing removal? Um, 
Yeah. What were you, what were were you pulling like up? Four dump truck loads of stuff up. <laughs> I'm guessing it was Winter Creek. Were you pulling up mines? Okay. Yeah. Privet. Ugh. Privet. Yeah. Two of the worst things on Huguenot Flatwater. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I helped survey Huguenot Flatwater, and we ended up breaking it up to all these. You know, we had this sort of bright spot at Huguenot Flatwater, which is represented in that C-shaped or U-shaped, I should say. Uh, yellow area where there was this boundary there with Riverside Drive on the bottom um, as if you were going to uh, the parking lot you know around the corner um, where there were there was you know it wasn't quite so bad and there were some actual uh, good things there can you go back and you go back on sure Nathan, you might point it on the map of where we were oh yeah you, 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 you guys were working in okay. this area here. right you around the see. parking lot yeah yeah, there's a lot of privet there. I remember that. So um, everybody has their kind of sense of place there. The, the river is kind of on the door. So here's the parking lot. That's the parking lot there. And I guess the, the core, and then the bridge, the yes. swath running. Yes, the Huguenot. Yeah, that's the Huguenot Bridge. So what did we find there when we surveyed it? Well, in that area where you were, uh, the larger area, 21 invasive species. Nine with a ranking of high invasiveness, seven medium, five low. But primarily, you've got that Euonymus or Winter Creeper on the left, the Privet in the middle, and then the Amur, or also called Bush Honeysuckle, on the end. Uh, those were th the the Euonymus is so overwhelming; it's definitely the dominant um, feature there. Oops. So. I've been doing this sort of thing in different places for a long time, and I can tell you, it is as you might imagine, discouraging. I mean, nobody is going to pretend that you come off of an invasive uh, project feeling incredibly optimistic and hopeful about how it's going. It can get incredibly discouraging. But, so we all need some good news to keep us going, and I, goats are always good news. So we were talking about prescriptives, right? Treatment plans, recipes, goats are part of that. I'm gonna let Nathan talk, but first let me tell you about some of the good news at Huguenot Flatwater. So, you, all you hear, it's very easy just to only see invasive plants and just feel overwhelmed with the invasive plants. But at Huguenot Flatwater, at the same time that we were inventorying the invasives, we were taking note of the native plants. It's not all bad. And in Huguenot Flatwater, we also identified, and this is tree canopy, box elder, sycamore, green ash, which is remarkable because if you know anything about green ash, it's um, under assault from the emerald ash borer. Black walnut, hackberry, hickories, pawpaw, bladder nut, spice bush, wood nettle, poison ivy. Poison ivy is a native plant, by the way. I don't. I have some on my wrist right now, and I'm fine with that. Virginia creeper, and then many other um, native plants as well. So that's what keeps us going. We want those natives to survive and thrive, and we want to tip the balance so that it's there are more natives and fewer invasives. And I'm gonna get let Nathan talk a little bit about the different methods that he's been using in the park system and, and the things that we're exploring, including adorable goats. <laughs> so yes, um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, we've been moving into implementation um, and with that developing prescriptives for exactly how you're supposed to handle what these different types of plants at different times of year and what you should be focused on at that time of year or what you shouldn't focus on or don't do during that time of year. Um, so with that, you know, we really, at James River Park System being this wilderness area park, um, we really try to focus on kind of the, the more naturalized um, treatments before we move into more mechanical treatments. Um, so of course we use a lot of physical labor. And you guys represent a good portion of that, so thank you. Um, so beyond just you know, physical labor being out there, manpower, um, we love to employ goats, right? The 20 goats in a, you know, a defined area for about a week, you'd be amazed at what they would do. Um, they'll eat everything, everything, right? Um, so moving from goats, typically what we've been doing is we'll, we'll bring in goats. Um, we'll have ghosts graze through the whole area, um, so they'll take down all of the, uh, they'll eat bush honeysuckle, they won't eat the stems or anything, they'll eat all the English ivy, they'll eat all the creeper, they'll eat all the multi-floor rose, and pretty much anything else that you could think of in that area that's green, and they'll go up as high as they can get, they'll get up on their back legs and get up there as far as they can go. 
Um, so we usually run them through once, um, and that's where folks like yourselves come in. Um, so we bring in manpower behind it, or human power. <laughs> uh, behind that behind that effort um, and that focus is usually on any of the, the woody vines or shrubs that have been left behind that we know are invasive um, what we're really focused on at that point is actually getting the roots out um, in any manner that we can usually it's a lot of maddoxes and shovels we've got these things called puller bears which are basically uh, has a clamp on the end of it and has a long pole so it gives you good leverage and you can really yank on those things and get most of them, most of the roots out. It's actually quite gratifying. <laughs> it's honestly. good exercise. Yeah. Um, so you know, those, that's typically the method. We'll then bring back in goats for a second round and then we'll, we'll typically plant after that. Um, there's some times where we don't necessarily have that luxury or we don't have that need. Um, so we, uh, sometimes we can go straight from just, you know, human power, you know, or folks that are out there actually doing grubbing, digging, removal of invasives to planting. Um, and then there's times where we need to go to a more mechanical form. Um, so as I mentioned on Belle Isle, you know, there are lots of large Atlantis trees that were seed bearing trees um, that we needed to have removed. So we brought in an arborist, um, they came in, bucket trucks, claw trucks, all that good stuff, and they removed those trees for us. Um, there's other times, um, as, as we realize and recognize moving forward, um, that there will be times where we do need to use chemicals. Um, it would try to keep that kind of to a minimum, but there, there will be times where we're just going to have to use chemicals. Um, there's, there's kind of no way around it. So, but it's making sure that we're doing you know, those progressive um, methods, if you will, um, leading up to that and not just jumping to that foregone conclusion. Um, some of the other ways that, that we've really been focused on um, removal, I think that we've been starting to kind of experiment with. Um, we've been looking at um, deep mulching, um, where you put in you know, four to six layers of mulch over an area, um, and what mulch does is compost, and when it composts, it heats up. So it kills all of those weed seeds because those things can't get too hot. Um, so we've been experimenting with that. Um, we've got a couple other experiments that we've been working on, um, depending on you know, if it's Johnson grass versus you know, some other shrub. Um, so there's a lot of things that are kind of going on right now with that. And we've actually got um, some um, biology folks from William & Mary as well as some from VCU that are starting to do um, some studies kind of around those, those different methods. And the seasonal piece has to do with the with the, the the life cycle of the plant a lot of the times. So and when it comes to a seed uh, bearing plant, this is crucial. So for instance, at Pony Pasture, which we're really just kind of getting ready to, to launch. I mean, stuff's been done in the past, but my Master Naturals chapter is going to be adopting that area, so we'll be developing our prescriptives and our plan. We did a big garlic mustard pull, for instance, in the spring. Well, you got to pull it before it goes to seed. That's the case with a lot of herbaceous plants. Same thing with perilla. We were doing perilla pulls on Belle Isle before it goes to seed. Because if you don't, if you if it's gone to seed and you start pulling it, you're just contributing to the spread of the seed. So that's the kind of seasonal stuff that can come into play with um, with removals. We do have a, a nascent. Uh, website um, on the park system, or I guess it's the Friends of James River Park, hosts the site that has some content on it. Just um, <clears throat> it'll be evolving over time. So if you're interested, you can uh, get on this website and keep an eye on what we're up to. And I know there's about I think there's probably five minutes left in this hour. Did we want to go ahead and go to questions so they get an opportunity to yeah, ask great. questions? Yeah, you touched on a bunch of things. I think that links into that. Thing. Uh, Dr. Wooskos, I think, met with Dr. Um, with, uh, Kevin Heffernan yeah. earlier, mm -hmm. who developed that kind oh, of great. The, the, the list yes. of invasive species mm -hmm. and their invasiveness. Kind of for the and same Kevin's thing. been at yeah, the task force table. It's kind yeah. of linked to that. And, uh, and our, our, my class has kind of looked at the, um, the actually has a plant, uh, the whole plant, the, um, a bunch of the documents about plant are actually on box. Or something that we want to check out too. Nice thing. So, um, are there questions? Um, any comments? Questions? You know, very. Uh, yeah, yeah, in certain areas where we bring in goats, if we know that there are native plants in, in those areas that we want to preserve, um, then we can fence those areas off and keep the goats out. Um, you know, many of the 
What happens typically though, yes, they'll graze everything. Um, but usually those native plants are fairly capable of rebounding, um, especially from a grazing or something like that. Um, whereas you know, some of the natives aren't necessarily as able or readily able to rebound. In the way back? Um, so in chemical application, um, there there's not only guidelines as to what type you can use, where you can use it, and how you can use it, so there's some specific amounts, I mean, down to the millimeter of how much you know, you're actually supposed to use you know, for, um, for any certain volume of water to this you know, chemical ratio. Um, but typically what will happen is we use um, a very pointed method. Um, a lot of times it's actually somebody with an actual can um, of this chemical and then they're actually painting it on the actual stump or tree that, or, that we would like to have killed. Um, so that way, again, it's a very pointed um, application. Um, there's also methods that you can use even if you're using a spray applicator um, where you can put um, I mean, something as simple as you know, a plastic water bottle, you can tape it over the end of it. So you know, really your spray range can only be you know, a couple inches in diameter. Um, so that way, again, you can have a very pointed um, you know, application instead of this casting a wide net. And there's also, uh, if, for instance, you're not going to use an herbicide if, if, it's, if you're going to be getting rain <laughs> the next day. Uh, there are certain herbicides you do not use in riparian areas, whereas others are safe for aquatic areas. And there's a whole lot of guidelines around that. There were hands in the back in the corner here. In the, Are there aquatic invaders? There in are, the yes. Zone? There's a okay. number of them. Um, however, this was a terrestrial plant. Not, we, we did not deal with aquatic invasives. Um, and really, for us, the, the issue comes in that the water actually is state property. Um, so there's a whole other set of flaming hurdles that you have to get over in order to, to do that. Why don't we just move? Should we move? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, I just agree. Uh, I mean, well, animals do uh, move seeds around in particular, but, or from uh, disturbing soil um, to carrying seeds around. Um, the, the, divide, the, the problem's not isolated to the park system. All you have to do is look at all the property surrounding the park system, and it's the same set of conditions on private property. So part of, part of our goal is to also educate private property owners to, at the very least, for instance, cut I English ivy back from their trees so it doesn't imperil the trees. And uh, you, you might know about English ivy, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't complete its life cycle till it climbs the vertical surface to grab the sunlight. That's when it goes to see it fruits and it flowers and fruits, you know, at that point. So like that's one way of, okay, we're not asking you to get rid of all the English ivy on your property, but can you cut it back from your trees and, and stop it in that respect? Birds, obviously. This is an interesting issue if you all are, you know, if you really want to talk about biological diversity and food webs, yes, birds will eat and transfer the seeds of invasive plants, but there's some there's a lot of research going into whether or not that's the right food source for you know a lot of a lot of species have very specific food sources at very specific times and that's one way you can end up with with more generalist species and fewer specialist species and that also that those invasive plants don't necessarily pack the nutrition that these birds need particularly if they're migratory species so it gets wonderfully complex but yes wildlife do contribute to the spread of, of invasive plants Yes. Is the question, do you see a difference in the types of species in a natural area in an urban region compared to say like out in the Blue Ridge? Yeah. Yes. And I, you know, I will just say from my own experience and where I grew up in the 
the northern Shenandoah Valley, northern Blue Ridge, and I do a lot of invasive work on my parents' property. It's completely, there is some overlap in the species, but it's a different ecosystem for one thing. Um, but they're very different species that are problematic. English ivy is a huge problem in Richmond's parks because people planted it. It was an ornamental. So I think we deal with so many plant species that were originally planted in gardens as ornamentals and escaped cultivation. I think the thing to remember on that as well is that you know, invasives thrive on disturbed land. Um, and in any urban environment, you have an abundance of disturbed land. Um, whereas in rural environments, that, that the ecosystem tends to stay intact. Um, so you have less opportunity for those invasives to take a foothold. Um, so I know you said basically it's impossible to, <clears throat> to entirely eradicate invasive species. And I know there's probably like very long term, basically permanent kind of monitoring work, but is there a point that you'd be like at an acceptable level for this project? Is there kind of like a yeah. goal? Our goal is to get these invasive species down to 20%. Um, at that point, um, ecologically, it's at an insignificant enough level where our natives can have a real opportunity to start to repopulate and thrive. Um, so we're aiming for 20% um, for all of the, the listed invasives that we, that we have there. So, you know, come back to this website because hopefully you're going to see changes in color on that map as well. But if that's a very long term goal. I mean, you know, at some point you realize that this is something you're doing for a future that you will not be around to witness. And that's okay. That's okay. There, I think there were some more questions in the back that the guys in the back maybe? So yes. We may have time for two more questions. A bit. Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the community has a role when it comes to deciding policies uh, in the James River. So are they like consulting with everyone who's chemicals to combat Um, if you know anything about James River Park System, and especially the people that are you know, diehard users, uh, you, you would know that they love nature um, in, in all formats. So especially when you start talking about, you know, you're spraying a bunch of chemicals, um, yeah, red flags go up for a lot of people. Um, and that's why, you know, making sure that we're, we're doing everything we can to do, you know, the more naturalized um, versions of, of removal before we go to a more mechanized chemical format. Um, and as long as we are using that continuum um, and, and are able to explain exactly what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it, everybody's usually pretty, pretty confident. Last time when we went uh, to the airport, uh, we were told uh, by, uh, by the manager that uh, students from UVA are planning uh, more uh, vegan plants. Um, well, we've just submitted for a grant, National Fish and Wildlife Association grant, um, which will hopefully allow us to hire a part-time coordinator. Um, that will bolster um, the invasive species management plan quite significantly. Um, currently, you know, I, I wear 15, 20 different hats on any given day. Um, Laura is a volunteer, um, as well as everybody else that's a part of that invasive species management plan and task force. Um, so the need to have kind of a, somebody that's in the coordinator role, uh, that's paid, that's not always you know having lots of other things going on um, and lots of other wants to be able to do, um, that's going to help us out tremendously, um, as well as continued monitoring. Um, so with that funding, we'll also be able to continue uh, monitoring of the entire 600 acres and have report outs um, once a year. Um, so the goal, again, is to be able to really see some change take place um, as it relates to the color class that you see on, these, on this map um, for those different management units. Um, but being able to have you know, somebody that's permanently coordinating that, um, you know, even again on a part-time basis, um, will really bolster our ability to be able to further coordinate, um, receive grants, receive funding, and, and really put this thing in high gear. That's, I think that's a great. Did you have one? You there's, a, there's a young woman. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, I 
Well, for me, um, I've while I am local, um, I work for local government. Um, I coordinate on you know an ongoing basis with folks from the state level to the national level, um, and really with a heavy focus on the community. Um, the community truly is again what makes the park special, what makes the park what we all know and love. Um, so I'm always at community meetings uh, or meetings with you know, again state level or you know federal level um, folks. Uh, there's a lot of crossover, especially in Richmond. Um, you know. We have a lot of we have some uh, national battlefield parks. Um, we have Charter Ground Ironworks, which is also part of the National Park Service. Um, so there's a lot of overlap, um, not only with things that we're doing in James River Park System, um, but as it relates to national park sites as well as state parks. Um, Pocahontas State Park is our closest um, state park, which is in Chesterfield County. So it also happens to be the largest state park in Virginia. Um, we have a great relationship with Pocahontas. Um, between the two of us, um, the city of Richmond and um, Pocahontas State Park, we're actually the 14th ride center, International Mountain Bike Association ride center in the country. Um, so there's a lot of overlap between local government, state, and, and federal government as it relates to, to my job. And then were you talking also about just co a potential career paths that, that students might be interested in? Pursuing it's it's interesting because when I was in your place decades ago, <laughs> you know I remember looking at uh, you know my college handbook and and looking at biology degrees and environmental studies and going I can't do that I can't do science that's why in my middle age I am a, a, a master naturalist as a volunteer a lot of us you know ended up frustrated scientists ended up doing you know this type of volunteer work later but there are people like VHB. Right, Chris is a wetland scientist who's doing this work. So there's there's private sector opportunities. Uh, some of the, the conservation services. There are organizations, businesses, not just nonprofits, but businesses that are in the business of uh, restoration ecology. To me, restoration ecology would be the most exciting. Um, field to work, and this is something that's besides happening. Besides parks, oh, well, besides parks, of course. <laughs> but this is something that's happening nationwide. It's it's happening everywhere. It's not just happening in Richmond in terms of battling invasives and doing this restoration ecology work. And then there's the nonprofit realm. Uh, Amber Ellis, if you all ever happen to come across Amber Ellis with the James River Association, she's their watershed coordinator. I think that's her title. She's on the task force, and she is amazing. Um, so I think that there's just the sky's the limit in terms of how you could apply um, this type of, of pursuit. I was fortunate because I actually have a career in my field. I have a degree in Parks and Recreation yeah. Management and Modern Environmental Studies with BCU. Uh, so I consider myself fortunate that I have a job in my field. But we're fortunate that you two came and kind of shared uh, your time with us today. And it always amazes me how much the James River Park System is able to do with relatively so little resources. And it's through these kind of partnerships and leveraging those kinds of opportunities. Let's thank them for coming.